Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, dive back in. Uh, just a little reminder of where we are and where we're going. Uh, next Monday uh, evening, undergraduates, you have assignment due, uh, assignment two due, uh, in which you're going to be adding objects and joints to your empty simulator. We'll talk about those briefly in a moment. Uh, graduate students, you moved on to assignments three and four. How is everybody doing with installing PyroSim? Hands up if you have a running version of PyroSim running. Okay, that's pretty much every hand in the room, not quite. If you're still having problems, email me. I will try and schedule some time uh, when you can meet with either myself or the TA outside of office hours. Try and get everybody caught up uh, and so we can get on to the fun stuff. Um, assignment two, just a, a couple things to keep in mind. As I mentioned last time, as you move your way through about the first five or six assignments, some of the things you're implementing are visible like objects and other things are not visible like joints. You can't actually see joints uh, in PyroSim, but you can often see the effect uh, of joints. So let's talk about uh, joints for a moment. Um, there are lots of different kinds in PyroSim. We're going to, uh, in the assignments here, we're mostly going to be working with rotational joints that work very much like our knees and elbows. They lock pairs of objects together and force those objects to rotate relative to one another, but not change their position relative to one another. Those connected objects can no longer separate. If you've added a joint to your simulation and you see a pair of objects physically separate, there's something wrong with your uh, definition of the, the joint. Okay, again, as I mentioned last time, I want you to burn this coordinate system into your brain, and if, you, if you've memorized it, it'll be very useful and help you as you move through the assignments. Let's talk about joints for a moment. They have a number of settings that you need to set when you create them. The first one is what is the position of the joint uh, itself? So usually we want that joint to exist in X, Y, Z at the position where the two objects overlap, right? Kind of makes sense. You bring two objects together and you weld them together with a joint. The way in which pairs of objects rotate relative to one another is dependent on the joint's normal. So let's talk about joint normals for a moment. I'm going to use my upper arm and my lower arm as the two objects. Um, if the two objects are sitting horizontally like this, which plane, what two-dimensional plane do my upper and lower arm uh, exist in? Y. Y and? X. The XY plane, right? So I'm going to try and define a joint so that the two objects are going to move through the XY plane. As we start to move on to more and more complex uh, robots, the entire set of connected objects may start to rotate in three-dimensional space, but you don't need to worry about that. That's what the physics engine is going to do for you. So you might start by defining the two objects to exist in the X, Y plane. Once they start moving, they're gonna occupy some different two-dimensional plane. But again, assuming we connect them with the rotational joint, they should always be locked into a two-dimensional plane. If, if my uh, lower arm is connected to my upper arm with one rotational joint, it shouldn't be moving arbitrarily outside of the plane. So far, so good? Okay, so how do I tell the physics engine that I want to lock these two objects into the XY, uh, the XY plane, at least to start? I define a joint normal, which is defined as a vector, and as the name implies, it's normal or orthogonal to the plane through which I want the pair of objects to move. So if I want the pair of objects to rotate through the XY plane, what is the joint normal? Z, right? So 0, 0, 1 would be that vector placed. You can visualize it as being placed at the position of the joint, which will cause them to do this. What about the joint normal 0, 0, minus 1? Just as good, right? That's perfectly fine. Either uh, is fine. What happens if I make a mistake? And let's see if I can do this here. I've got my upper arm lying along the x-axis and my lower arm lying along the y-axis. And I define the joint normal 0, 1, 0 along the y-plane. How will these two objects rotate relative to one another? They'll still rotate relative to one another. With respect to the y-axis, obviously it's a little bit difficult to do in your head. 
while you're at, in assignment two, this is a good place to play around with some of those things. It should rotate like this. I can't do it perfectly, obviously, because my, the joint normal for my elbow is 0, 0, 001, but you get, you get the idea. Right? Okay. What happens if instead, or like in uh, the scissor bot here, I define my upper arm lying along the y-axis, or the red object lying along the y-axis, and the white object lying along the z-axis, and I want them to rotate in the yz plane, what's the joint normal for that? X, right? Exactly. Okay, so that's the idea about the joint normal. It's pretty obvious for this. We're going to start to build some more complex robots in later assignments. But again, memorize the coordinate system and make sure that you can manipulate joint normals to get the operations that you want. If you are coding up your uh, joints and you place the joint in the wrong position, you do not place it at the point at which the pairs of objects overlap, what happens? Some of you have probably seen this behavior already. They're not connected anymore once the Exactly. So uh, again, I can't do this physically. So let's assume we have one object here, which is attached to another object here. And instead of placing the position of the joint where they overlap, we put the joint by mistake somewhere out here. So instead of giving a positive x value, you give a negative x value. Again, you can't see the joint. But the moment that these objects start to move, they will rotate about this point and they will physically separate from one another. You can think of the joint as connecting, uh, or connecting to the object at the center of that object and the joint also connecting to the center of that object. And then these things are sort of swinging from a string or a bar uh, and that gives you sort of the idea about what's, what's going on. Okay, joints are invisible so you can't see exactly where they're placed or their joint normal, but based on what you see in the simulation, that should give you a hint to go back and debug uh, joints or any other components of the robots that we're going to build as we move forward. Yes? Just out of curiosity, have you made any robots or made use of like a joint outside of objects? Uh, it comes in handy if you want to do things like pendula, something that is swinging. Um, if you have points that are connected, maybe not with a rigid bar, but with a spring. Remember the tensegrity robots we saw at the very beginning of the first class, where we had these rigid bars that were attached with springs. If you were to try and simulate that tensegrity robot, you would be using joints that exist outside the points of overlap, because rigid bars in a tensegrity robot, by definition, do not overlap, they do not touch. Good question. Okay, any other questions about objects or joints before we jump back to our lecture? No? Okay. We're gonna finish our discussion today on embodied cognition. We did a short history on the entire field of AI and where evolutionary robotics sits in that landscape uh, last time. And we started on this philosophical approach to intelligence, which many roboticists have adopted, which is if we want to try and create intelligent machines, it's going to be impossible to do so by building a brain in a computer. We're going to have to build brains that exist in bodies, where the brain can use that body as a tool to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. That's the basic idea of embodied cognition. Okay, and we were exploring this idea of embodied cognition last time uh, by looking at um, different aspects or building blocks of intelligence, like for example planning, which we ended with last time. We looked at non-embodied planning, uh, like uh, Deep Blue, which beat Gary Kasparov back in the 90s. We had a, a brief digression here into whether or not we have free will. Again, I'm not trying to prove one way or the other. The Libet experiment is a particularly striking reminder that thinking about thinking is misleading. I choose to do X at this point in time. It's obvious, I know I made that decision autonomously, and I know I made it at that particular point in time. Seems obvious, neuroscience tends to suggest not quite. So we'll just keep that in the back of our minds as we move forward. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay, we also feel if we're thinking about the future, that we're sitting quietly, we're in our heads, we create a mental image of leaving the classroom, leaving the Vodi building at 945. We imagine ourselves flowing down the hallway and out of the building, and then when the bell rings, 
execute, right? That's what it feels like we're doing when we're planning future actions. As Libet just reminded us, maybe or maybe not. Turns out that this particular approach, when you build it into a machine, is not very satisfying. Why not? It, Shaky did, right? So again, Shaky had state-of-the-art computer technology on board at the time, so Shaky was a little slow in doing that. Even with 2019 uh, computer technology and a connection to the cloud, this is still sort of this very uh, serial, one step after the other process. Is this the best way to do things? If we want to exist and survive and adapt in the real world, you better be able to do it in real time because the world will not wait for you to figure out what to do next. So back in the 1980s, um, Rod Brooks, uh, who was the director of the AI lab at MIT at the time, uh, which I mentioned a couple weeks ago, sort of mecca uh, for the beginnings of AI, he was the director of the AI lab, um, and introduced an alternative approach known now as the subsumption architecture. It has a number of properties that are different from Shakey's approach. The main one, as, as you can see here, is that any robot that has a subsumption architecture built into it is thinking in parallel. The human brain is in a massively parallel machine. Here's a simple parallel machine to sort of give you an idea about how this might work. The idea underlying subsumption architecture is that the robot should always be reacting to its sensor data. It should not be pulling sensor data out of the world, shutting down its eyes and its ears and all its sensors, thinking, planning, and then waking up and acting again. Any robot with a subsumption architecture is always instantaneously responding to what's going on in the world around it, at least according to its sensors. However, that's tricky because you've got a flood of data coming in all the time. Which part of your incoming sensory stream do you respond to at any given time? Some of you wear wrist watches. If you pay attention to your wrist watch, you can suddenly feel the pressure of the watch against your wrist but most of the time you're not aware of the fact that you're wearing a watch or jewelry or what have you, right? It's just sort of there in the background. You can summon it up and now you're paying attention to it. But again, one of the important things about surviving and acting in the real world is being able to respond to what's happening to you in real time, but also not reacting to everything because you have a huge amount of data coming in. So a secret to intelligent action, one aspect of it is what to ignore. And turns out in the history of AI, that's been a, a particularly difficult problem to solve, what to ignore. The subsumption architecture is one approach to try and deal with this problem. We have a different number of uh, sensors in this cartoon example here, light sensors, audio sensors, and obstacle sensors. And we're gonna order or sequence these sensors as those that are reporting more important information. So the most important information is we have a robot that's moving around and suddenly the obstacle sensors say there's an obstacle right in front of you. That is more important than light sensors because you're interested in a light source. You'll remember the aggressor uh, from last time, the Bradenburg vehicle that moves towards light. Go and find light or find food, but if there's suddenly a dangerous situation, like you're about to run into an obstacle, that should subsume your attention. It should take over your attention from other things that are out there, right? Hopefully you're deeply engrossed in this lecture, but if we hear a fire alarm, that signal should suddenly subsume everything we're talking about in this classroom and we should switch our behavior to be dependent on the fire alarm, right? Okay, so we have obstacle sensors and we have some internal circuit that could be like the two crossed wires we saw in the Breitenberg vehicle. Um, in this case, we want the robot to avoid the obstacles, so we might put a little small powered vehicle in there that moves away from obstacles. If there's an obstacle on my left, turn to the right. If there's an obstacle on my right, turn to the left, right? That's what you can imagine is inside this little box here, and that little box then si sends signals out to the motor uh, drives. Okay. 
If there are no obstacles nearby, then the next layer in the hierarchy can sort of take over or subsume control here. So we have audio sensors. If suddenly there's a loud sound on my left, I move away from that loud sound, and I'm trying to avoid loud sounds, but if at any time during the execution of this powered vehicle, suddenly my obstacle sensors speak up, they subsume or take over control of the motors. So we have these different Breitenberg vehicles ordered by uh, urgency, and any one of them can take over control of the motors at any time, but the precedence is given to the ones that are more important. So there is always in this cartoon a direct connection from the sensors to the motors. That is not the case in Shaky the robot. We have sensor information coming in, and then we have this long pipeline of modeling, planning, and then eventually acting. That's the subsumption architecture. OK, if there's no obstacles and no loud sounds, I'm interested in light. I'm free to go follow the light. Um, if I get bored of the light, if there's no light, maybe I just move around uh, at random. I explore. I'm curious. I'm looking for things to do. OK. Uh, as I mentioned, this was an uh, AI architecture proposed by Rod Brooks uh, at the AI lab. He left the AI lab uh, in the early 1990s and founded a robot company which produces the most successful, maybe the only commercially successful autonomous robot on the market today. What is that robot? Roomba. The Roomba. If you have a Roomba at home, that's what it's running, right? If all things being equal, move at random. If you sense that you're about to go over the lip of the top of the stairs, stop moving randomly, turn 180, and head in the other direction. If you bump into something, stop moving forward, turn, and go in the other direction. If you're not detecting obstacles or the edge of the top of the stairs, move randomly or move in some regular pattern to clean the floor. That's it. Pretty simple. That's what's inside your Roomba. OK, so again, behaviors are arranged in parallel. One behavior is always in control. The Roomba is always reacting in real time to what's, what's going on around it. Imagine that it smashed into a very valuable piece of furniture and kept grinding the wheels for a few seconds, trying to go forward while, like, sh like Shaky, it was trying to figure out, is this actually a table leg? Is it not? It's wearing off the wood varnish on your, on your nice piece of furniture and eventually decides, yes, this is furniture, and turns in the other direction. Not a good strategy, right? Simple, but real-time reaction. OK. OK, so this idea of embodied cognition, here's a, an old desktop computer. In some sense, it has a body. It's embedded in a physical structure. My, my laptop here is inside a physical uh, shell. But it is not a body in the important sense that we're interested in, which is that it's a tool with which it can push against the world and push back. OK. So um, embodied cognition says the way in which you process information is affected by the fact that you have this tool, this ability to push against and observe how the world pushes back. One of the interesting things about having a body and having sensors is that the moment you move, the moment you act in the environment, your relationship to the environment changes. And assuming that you can sense that change, the feedback loop is instantaneous, or at least at the speed of light if we're talking about light sensors and photons. Right? As I walk around the room, the relative positions of all of your faces in my field of view changes. That's an opportunity that a learning or intelligent machine can take advantage of. I am not sitting here passively waiting for sensor data to come to me. I can act and collect new kinds of data. That's extremely important. Some of you sitting in the back of the room, your faces are occluded from me. If I want to see your face, all I need to do is move, right? Doesn't matter how many frames per second or how much data I'm getting. If I can't move, I can't see you, and there's nothing much I can do about that situation. Okay. So, Again, non-embodied technologies, in a way, are sort of passive. They have to wait for a human or the internet to give them information. And the learner, the non-embodied learner, has to hope that there is enough information in that data that's being provided to do whatever it is 
that you want to do. That is fundamentally different from every organism on the planet, which to a greater or lesser extent has some freedom to go out and get the information that it needs. Okay. Related to this idea of embodied cognition is situated cognition. Not quite the same thing. Embodiment says you have a body. You can push against the world. Situatedness is that you have sensors and that you're sensing the world in real time. Turns out that you can have embodied but non-situated machines, and you can have situated and non-embodied machines. An example of a situated, non-embodied machine would be an embedded device. If you go over to the Davis Center, go find an empty classroom somewhere there, or an empty room, sit in the room, and if you sit quietly and don't move for long enough, what happens? You fall asleep, that's possible. What happens in the room, not necessarily to you? The lights turn off. The lights turn off, right? So there is a little intelligent sensor that's looking for motion, and if there's no motion after a minute or two, it turns off the, the lights, right? So that sensor, that embedded, that intelligent light sensor is intelligent in a limited sense. It's sensing the environment, but it's not embodied. It can't act on the world. You could argue that it's minimally embodied. It can turn the light on and off, but not really, right? So that's an example of sort of a situated non-embodied uh, device. Okay. A computer, a traditional de laptop or desktop, is also non-situated. Usually can't sense things in real time, but that's of course starting to change. My laptop has a webcam on it and it's watching me in real time. Your smartphone has accelerometers and other sensors which it's recording information about itself and you in real time. So our devices are becoming a little bit more situated, but not very embodied, right? My laptop can't autonomously close itself down or walk out of the room. But don't laptops have like light sensors and things to like change their displays? Absolutely, right? So ch they can change their own display. They can act in a certain way, right? There's certain actions that your computer can carry out. They have limited impact on the world around them. As long as there's a human that's observing the screen, that's, that's all well and good. So far, so good? OK. We're going to use this term complete agent throughout this course, and I'm going to use this as shorthand for anything that is both embodied and situated. So again, we're using agent here like Breitenberg did with the word vehicles. I'm not going to distinguish between organisms and machines. Most organisms are embodied and situated. Depending on the machine, it may or may not be embodied or may or may not be situated. A complete agent is both. In the reading for today's lecture, uh, the reading talks about five properties that any complete agent has. We're going to focus on just the three for our purposes today. If you are embodied and you have a physical body in the physical world, you are beholden to the laws uh, of physics by being in the world. A Cartesian approach to this idea is that this is a drag, a literal drag on you, right? It's sort of a limitation. There's only so much you can do because gravity is always pulling on you, right? According to Descartes, the body is always a problem. The mind and the soul is the real seat of intelligence. In embodied cognition, we turn that thinking around. And instead of thinking about the fact that any body is beholden to the laws of physics, instead of that being an obstacle or a challenge to get over, it's an opportunity that can be exploited. How do organisms exploit the fact that they have mass? How about walking? You use kind of a falling motion to make walking and mobility more efficient. Exactly. So bipedal walkers like us exploit the fact that we're beholden to gravity, where every time your foot leaves the ground when you're walking, most of the muscles in your leg go slack, and your leg acts like a passive pendulum. And if a pendulum starts rotated backwards, and it's connected, in this case, at the hip, because it's beholden to gravity, it will accelerate to the vertical position. And because it's physical, it also has momentum, which will carry the leg forward, causing your center of mass to move forward, causing your, le your heel to strike the ground. And the moment your heel strikes the ground, you tense the muscles in your leg, make your leg rigid, and your body rocks over what's known as your stance leg. Your weight is on it. 
So if you think about that, and as you leave lecture today, you can feel it, half the time, one of your legs is, uh, is slack, you're not using energy. All the time during walking, one of your legs is relaxed. The other one is exerting physical work. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about that when we come to our pair of lectures on legged locomotion and our discussion about biomechanics. Obviously, walking in little or zero G is basically impossible. It evolved, bipedal locomotion evolved to exploit this fact, which allowed our ancestors on the African savanna to travel a very, very long distance on a very small amount of food and water. It's a very good reason why bipedal locomotion evolved. Okay, as I've already mentioned, if you're both embodied and, and uh, situated, if you move, you generate sensory stimulation. You don't have to wait for someone to give you an image or a video. You can go out and collect information by moving, which again is something that evolution can exploit. What are some examples from nature of exploitation of that property? The property here is the moment you move or an organism moves, it generates sensory data, which is useful for whatever the organism is trying to do. That would not be available to it if it just sat still. Birds will bob their head to get a look. Absolutely. So like us, they often are looking. That's, that's, an, that's a common one. Bats will chirp and use echolocation. <laughs> Bats will chirp and use echolocation, exactly. So they act, they send out a signal, and the repercussions of that action that come back give them a lot of information about their surroundings and prey. That's a great example of pushing against the world and generating sensory stimulation that's useful for what the bat is trying to do. Uh, like wolves will howl to communicate. Absolutely. So language itself is a great, great example of that. Lots of organisms out there that have evolved and use various kinds of language. If you have a dog at home and you talk to your dog and it cocks its head, you ever wondered why? To get a better idea of where the noise is coming from. <clears throat> to get a better idea of where the noise is coming from or maybe resolve the signal a little bit. All the pinna of mammalian ears or the shape of your ear or your dog's ear, it's very complex. Um, and it turns out that if you cock your head, it helps you orient and, and localize where a sound is coming from. The moment the dog or you move your head, that alters the way that sound that's arriving at your ears bounces around inside your pinna and eventually reaches your eardrum. You are moving and altering the kind of auditory stimulation you're receiving. Your dog does the same thing. Okay. We also affect not just our own sensory stimulation when we move, but we also have an impact on the environment when we move, which again is something that evolution can exploit. What are some examples from nature of organisms or human behavior in which we actively act to alter our environment in a way that's helpful to us? Absolutely, right? So we have greatly altered our environment. So you can argue that the human species is the best or possibly the worst at altering its environment for its own purposes. Again, maybe a discussion for another day. Non-human examples. We clearly alter our environment to great extents. What about other organisms? Ants. Ants do this to a great extent. They leave chemical pheromone. As ants move about, they actually leave chemical signals uh, in their environment. We'll talk about that later in the course as well. We just had a heavy snowfall, and it wasn't maybe possible until today, but now you'll start to see that we all collectively are going to alter the outdoor environment on campus today. How so? By the end of today, what are you gonna see on campus, aside from a whole bunch of dirty snow? Salt, okay. A whole bunch of goat paths, foot paths. The goat paths, right? So you're gonna see shortest paths between the main buildings on campus reappearing in the snow fields outside as we all collectively take the shortest path to our next class or our, our, la our next meeting because the snow is low enough now that we can actually do this, right? We are affecting the environment. We are leaving signals in the snow that those that are gonna come after us are going to see, 
and follow, right? We do it all the time. We're not often aware that we're even doing so. We'll again come back to this topic when we talk about robot swarms and collective behavior. Okay, so just to wrap up our discussion of embodied cognition today, let's try and fill in these four cells here of examples of machines or organisms that are or are not embodied and are or are not situated. We've already talked about a few of these. What are some examples of non-situated disembodied machines? People in comas. People in comas, okay, that's a, that's a great example. They have a body, but they're not really using it at the moment. The cloud, that's an interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. So the cloud doesn't really sense things in real time unless you connect real time sensors to the cloud. But the cloud itself, you could argue, is not really situated. It's waiting for inf information from the real world. It's not really embodied. If I were to ask you where the cloud is, you probably wouldn't have a good answer. The cloud is, of course, a staggering number uh, of computer clusters distributed around the world in boxes, but those boxes have limited ability to directly influence the world and observe how the world pushes back. They can indirectly do so by sending signals through devices to humans that then carry out actions for the cloud and collect information back. Um, what, would you, what would you consider like Futurama's like presidents in a jar? Ah, the head in the jar, that's a great example. Non-embodied, non-situated. Although I guess they talk Doesn't with they people. Can talk. They can talk. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Head, heads in jars. Hadn't had that one before. That's a, that's a good one. Situated and non-embodied. Alexa. Alexa. That's a great example, right? Alexa has no real body except her voice. She can perform actions, which is she can speak and observe how you speak back. So she's minimally embodied, but I think that's, that's a great example. She's listening most of the time in real time, so she's situated. Yeah, I'd put Alexa in that box. Uh, web a web camera, yeah, exactly, right? So intelligent light sensors, webcams, uh, accelerometers, any sort of sensor that's out there which has no body associated with it, right? It's just collecting information from the world. When you have something like Alexa and you connect like Internet of Things, things yep. to it, like lights and speakers and things that can draw your shades and whatnot. Then it's becoming more embodied, right? So, so like, does that become part of Alexa's body? Because like, if I turn on the light switch in my house, is that switch now part of my body because I can act on the switch? Absolutely. So the Internet of Things is a great recent example because it is in some sense embodied. The more devices we connect mm -hmm. to the, inter the Internet of Things, the more the IoT system as a whole can influence the world, and assuming there are sensors connected to the Internet of Things, the more ability it has to sense the repercussions of the action of the system as a whole. So yes, I think you could argue that IoT, the system as a whole, sits in the lower right box. It is both situated and embodied. In our discussion today, we're treating these as binary properties, either something is embodied or not. But clearly, as we get better at building these kinds of technologies, we're realizing it's a continuum. Right? A related term to embodiment, which we're not going to talk about in this class, is empowerment, which is what are all the different ways in which you can influence your environment. Certain organisms, simple organisms, have limited ability to influence the environment. Humans are figuring out more and more ways to influence our environment. We are becoming more embodied or more empowered. Okay, situated but disembodied, we just talked about. What about embodied but non-situated? You have a body with which to push against the world, but you cannot observe the repercussions of those actions. Industrial robots, which we talked about, the original sort of classical robots that were deployed in factories in the uh, 70s and 80s, most of those robots did not have sensors on them. They were programmed to carry out a very specific set of actions, like welding the car door, and the assumption was that the factory was built in, to such a uh, degree of precision that the next car door would arrive at exactly the right point in time and space for the robot to do what it had to do. Most modern industrial robots today obviously have sensors and are becoming more situated. Yes? Uh, possibly, yeah. I guess you could consider power tools, sort of any, any electronic tool at all that doesn't have a lot of feedback. Absolutely, it's acting on the world. A remote control car? A remote control car, yeah. Great, great example. Again, something that has an impact on the world but usually doesn't 
sense much of the repercussions. Okay, the bottom right is uh, where we live. Um, most of the robots that we're going to talk about in this class also are going to be both situated and embodied. One of the interesting things to keep in mind as we go through this class and we look at lots of different kinds of robots is for you to think about what can those robots do, what are they capable of, and what parts of the influence on the environment can they sense. Sometimes there isn't this perfect overlap between what I can do and sensing the repercussions of those actions. I put avatars down here from virtual worlds or computer games. This is just a reminder to you that an embodied agent does not need to be physical. In fact, in this class, you're going to be building virtual robots. They're not physical. They have a virtual body inside a virtual environment. They can act in that virtual environment and sense the repercussions of, those, of their actions in that virtual environment. Embodiment is not the same as physicality. Yep. Um, this is super technical, but like, what would you consider like a guitar tuner? A guitar tuner. That's a good one. I have to I have to think about that. I'll come back to that. Okay. So let's uh, switch gears now. That com that concludes our discussion of embodied cognition. Spent a lot of time talking about historical events, philosophical ideas. We're gonna do a 180 now and talk about the nuts and bolts of robotics and evolution and robotics in particular. And we're going to talk about three important tools that you're going to be using in the next few weeks. You've already seen a little bit of physical simulation. We'll talk more about that uh, next week. We'll also talk about evolutionary algorithms. We'll start our discussion today with artificial neural networks, which we're going to use to control our robots. OK. So I'm going to build up a neural network for you. We're going to build up a neural network, but we're going to start, again, with an embodied system. We've got our two Breitenberg vehicles here, the coward on the left and uh, the aggressor on the right. Each of these robots has two sensors, and they're connected by two wires to two motors. These wires are actually synaptic connections. They're altering or they're transferring signals that are coming in from the sensor layer of the robot. They're transforming them and sending them out to the motors, the output system of the robot. So for our purposes now, we're going to make this embodied system non-embodied. We're going to throw away the body and the sensors and the motors. And we're just going to look now at a naked neural network, which in this case has two input neurons and two output neurons, and two contralateral uh, synaptic connections. In these four neurons, I placed floating point values, which is to remind us that these neurons have value, have values. And when we place these neural networks in robots, they influence the behavior of the robot. So in the input layer here, those values represent the amount of light falling on the light sensors of the Breitenberg vehicles. And the values arriving at the output layer are commands to the motors. And we'll talk more about that when we get to physical simulation. OK. So the values at the input layer are coming from outside, in our case, sensors. And the values arriving at the output layer are going to the outside somehow, which in our case are motors. Let's add two more synapses, the ipsilateral uh, connections. So now we have, for each of the two output neurons, we have two arriving synapses. And we have these little plus values that we've borrowed from Breitenberg's cartoons. This was Breitenberg's shorthand for synaptic weights. So we're building up our neural network. As you can see, it's a network. We have nodes, which are neurons, and edges, which are synapses. And there are values associated with both the nodes and the synapses. The neurons have values, and the synapses have weights. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about synaptic weights, or I'll use just weights as shorthand. And the term weight is to remind us that a weight denotes the weight of influence of a source neuron on a target neuron. So in my little cartoon here, I've added uh, negative and positive weights. And we can compute the value at the output neuron by taking the values of the source neurons, so this neuron here has two source neurons. At this moment in time, those two source neurons have these two values. They, each of these two neurons has these two weights. We create the value in here by taking the raw value, multiplying it by the influence or weight of this neuron on this neuron, 
and then adding to it the value of this neuron multiplied by this synaptic weight, and that gives us a raw sum. For those of you that have heard of neural networks but aren't familiar with their details, at the very basement level of all neural networks, that's the basic algorithm that's going on. We have values from upper layers that are flowing to lower values, and the way they're doing so is by having neurons at the input layer, the upper layer, influencing the value of the neuron at the next layer down. By changing these synaptic weights, we can change the relative influence of source neurons on target neurons. So basically, we're computing a weighted sum uh, for each of these output neurons. What happens if a synaptic weight going from a source neuron to a target neuron is zero? There's no influence from the source neuron to the target neuron. There's no influence, right? So typically in a neural network, we're dealing with negative and positive values. And values that are closer and closer to zero mean that that source neuron has less and less influence on the value of the output neuron. The weight is less. And the greater the value diverges from zero, the more influence it has on that neuron. Negative values are inhibitory, meaning they inhibit or they push towards negative the value of the output neuron. And positive weights are excitatory, meaning they excite or they increase the value of the target neuron upward away from zero. In neural, network, uh, in neural networks, these are terms that were bro borrowed from neuroscience. So the synapses that exist in the, in the human nervous system, some of them inhibit or depress the value of the target neuron. Other synapses excite or cause that neuron to fire more strongly. We'll, we'll use this shorthand uh, quite a bit in the rest of the course. OK, so so far we've looked at two sets of parameters associated with neural networks, the values of the neurons and the weights of the synapses. As you can see in my little cartoon example here, for this particular neuron here, the raw weighted sum here is above 1. For reasons we'll talk about a little bit later, we often want to squash the values of our neurons to lie within pre some pre-specified range. In PyroSim, in the assignments, you're going to be squashing your neurons to, to squash them to have a value between minus 1 and plus 1. So what do we do if we get a raw value that's more than 1 or less than minus 1? We apply what's known as an activation function. So activation means the activation or the value of the neuron. And the function is going to alter that activation pattern. It's going to squash it back down within some desired uh, range. If you, uh, in your reading, you might come across sigma, which is often used to represent an activation function. There are different kinds of activation functions that you can use for different reasons. Again, this is not a course on artificial neural networks, so we're not going to get into that uh, too much. You can see, for example, uh, the threshold one is pretty simple. The little cartoons here, in each of these little cartoons here in the coordinate system, the x-axis represents the raw sum. So the further to the right we are, the larger the raw sum. The further to the left we are, the more negative the raw sum. And the y, uh, the y coordinate here <coughs> is the squashed value. That's going to be the actual value we assign to that neuron. So if we were to use, for example, threshold logic, and we get a raw sum of 1.29, uh, that's above our threshold of 1, so we're going to erase 1.29 and write in there 1.0. The second output uh, neuron there has a value of 0 0.09, which lies between 0 and 1, so we don't touch it. We leave it alone, according to the middle clause there of our threshold. If we get a value uh, that's negative, maybe we push it up towards 0. So sometimes we're squashing between 0 and 1, sometimes between minus 1 and plus 1. It doesn't matter too much at the moment for our purposes. Yes? Is it better to like, clip values or to normalize? Is it better to clip or normalize or use a sigmoid function? Uh, it, it depends on what we're trying to do. And again, it gets, it gets into a lot of the details of neural networks that we're, we're not going to touch on in this, this class. OK. OK, so if we use any of the threshold functions, then we need to obviously decide on a threshold. We have to pick a number, which introduces now a third set of parameters. We have our neuron values, our synaptic weights, 
and our activation thresholds. What's the uh, most negative and the most positive value we're going to allow for our neurons? Okay, so those are sort of the basic building blocks of neural networks. Let's now look at what neural networks can do. And I mentioned this last week, is that a neural network in essence is a transformation. It's a, it's a function that transforms incoming neuron values into outgoing neuron values. And by playing with synaptic weights or activation thresholds, we can alter that function. So just for fun, let's try and create a neural network that represents a particular function. And we're going to do a very, very simple function. We're going to do a binary function. And this binary function takes two inputs, two binary inputs. And we want a desired single output value. If we input 0, 0, we want 0 back out. If we input 0, 1, we want 0 back out, and so on. So we don't actually need two outputs in this case. We just need a single output value. So the idea is we want to try and create a neural network where if we take 0, 1, for example, supply it to the input layer, we should get the desired output, which in this case is 0 at the output layer. We have two synapses in this case, so we're going to have to pick two weights. We're going to assume we have a very simple activation function uh, that is going to squash the value of the single output neuron to either 0 or 1 because we want to have a binary output value. So far so good. What are those three numbers? What are the two weights that we need and what is the activation value, threshold value? Okay, so let's put uh, 0.5 here and 0.5 here and a threshold slightly above 0.5. Let's say 0.51. So let's try that out. We supply 0, 0 here. 0 times 0 0.5 is 0, plus 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 lies below our threshold of 0.51. So we place a 0 in the output neuron. So far, so good. What about the next one? It outputs, not 0.5, because we're going to squash it to a value between 0 and 1. The raw sum is going to be 0.5. We're inputting 0 and 1. 0 times 0.5 is 0. 0 0.5 times 1 is 0 0.5. 0 plus 0.5 is 0.5. So we have a raw value of 0.5. That value of 0.5 is slightly less than our threshold value, which is 0.51. So we erase 0.5 and we place 0 in its stead. 2 out of 2 so far. Okay. Let's just do the last one. 1, 1. 1 times 0.5 is 0.5. Plus 1 times 0.5 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 plus 0.5 is 1. A raw sum is 1. And 1 is greater than 0.51. So we get an output of 1. So 0.5 and 0.5 and a threshold of 0.51 instantiates that function that you see in the top right. What is that function? And, and right? So both the left and right inputs have to be 1 in order to get an output of 1. So there's a neural network. I picked 0.8. It doesn't really matter as long as it's something above 0.5. There's a neural network that instantiates the AND function. Right? As you can see from this even simple example, it turns out there's more than one neural network that will do the job. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.51, or 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.8. OK, let's take another function. What is this function? I heard it. It's the OR function. We can't use the neural network we just used. We have to alter it in some way. How might we alter it to instantiate the OR function? Exactly. We can lower our activation threshold below 0.5 to 0.1, which is a little bit more permissive, right? It means the threshold is lower. We're going to play, be placing one more often, right? I won't go through the math, but you can, again, just do it for yourself. 
uh, as you're starting to learn about neural networks, it's useful to go to sit down with pen and paper and actually make some of these neural networks. State-of-the-art deep learning uh, systems are made up of thousands or millions of neurons and synapses. They're completely inscrutable. You can look at all their details and have no idea exactly how they're working. It's a good idea to have an intuition at least for how simple neural networks work. So far, so good? OK. How about the XOR function? We want an output of 0. We want an output of 1 when one and only one of the two input neurons is one. Could you have um, one of them be a negative value? Yep, you can use negative weights, that's fine. So then just make P, P point 0.5 and then negative point 0.5. Okay. Um, and then if you get uh, zero, they're both activated. And if you get not zero. So we're going to have 0.5 here, minus 0.5, and what are we putting in here for the activation threshold? Uh, greater than, hmm. I feel like we need two, three. Uh, I don't know. Ideas. Absolute value. Absolute value? Of one, one. Maybe. Okay, more layer. Okay. Uh, ha, ha, ha. So this is a trick question. There is, again, assuming I put a lot of constraints here, for this simple neural network, there are no real values that will instantiate the XOR function. This was discovered in the 1980s when neural networks were first proposed. And there's a little bit more math to it, but that was the basic argument. This thing can't do XOR. It can't do a nonlinear function, meaning the output values are going up and then going down as the total amount of input is increasing. That killed neural network research for 30 years until the early 2000s, when finally people started to figure out some of the other problems with neural networks. Turns out that this problem, it can't solve the XOR problem, is easily solved by adding another layer. So we've just introduced another concept. We have neurons, synapses, synaptic weights, activation functions, activation thresholds, and now we can think about adding additional layers. This layer is traditionally known as a, <clears throat> a hidden layer, hidden in the sense that it's hidden from the real world, right? The input layer in our robot is touching the real world through an interface, which are sensors. The output layer is touching the real world by influencing motors, which influence the real world. But the hidden layers, the hidden neurons are not really directly, uh, they don't have any direct access to the physical world. They're hidden, they're sandwiched inside. So uh, again, throughout this course, we'll talk about input, hidden, and output neurons. If we expand our neural network to this size, which now has six synapses, two hidden neurons, and I put in brackets here, we need three activation functions, or activation thresholds. One for the first hidden neuron, second hidden neuron, and output neuron. What are they? So we need a total of nine values in this case. A little trickier. If you can't think off the top of your head what these nine values might be, think about the general strategy. Look at the output uh, values of the XOR function, and look at those for OR and AND. They're quite similar with a few differences. What's the general strategy you might use here to build up to, build up to an XOR neural network? You do something with odd and even numbers, and so, or no, odd, two odd numbers, and then if both of them are activated, you'll get an even number. Maybe. Again, as I mentioned, there's lots of different neural networks that can do this. Let's be a little bit lazy this morning, and let's try and build on what we've already done. Have a look at the XOR truth table here, and then if we look at, I'm going the wrong direction here. There we go. Okay. There's OR. And there's XOR. As you can see, OR and XOR differ by only one value. What sorts of general strategies might we use here? 
to build up the XOR function. Ideas? Yeah? So, um, I may not be understanding this right, but um, for the hidden neuron, if both of those have a value and then you add them together, they're going to be greater than the threshold value. Uh, not necessarily, right? So we're going to squash all the neuron values to, between, to be either 0 or 1. So we're going to, first of all, compute the values of the hidden neurons, like we did before, and then squash them with the activation value. So we're going to have either 0 or 1 sitting here. And then again, these synapses can have positive or negative weights. And then finally, we're going to squash the output value again to a value between 0 or 1. The idea is about general strategy. You could have the hidden layers activate if they receive an input from either one. OK. And if they activate from either one, which is which function? <laughs> which is an OR. An OR. We could have one of the, neuro one of the neurons compute the, uh, one of the hidden neurons compute the OR function. We're already kind of three, literally three quarters of the way there. And then just add the two together, and if they both out, like if you get the values that the value that's equal to both of them being added together, then you know that you should activate. Uh, we're getting getting very close now. So we're going to use OR. Yep. Yeah. Want to build on that idea? That would be OR. The other one's AND, and if both OR and AND are one, then that's the zero. Exactly. So we're going to be lazy. In here, we're going to place the OR function. So we know that this hidden neuron will only turn to 1 when, or sorry, this one will turn to 1 when, uh, when one of them or both is 1, one of the inputs. So we've got OR over here. We're going to place AND over here. If we place a synaptic weight of 1 here, that means that we're computing the OR function here, and the result of OR is flowing down here. We have a weight of 1. We're basically just copying down here. Over here, we have the result of the AND function. And that AND function is going to suppress this situation. Right? If this is a 1, it's OR. The only difference is this is a 0 in this fourth case. And we know that this value is 1. Yeah, I'm going in the wrong direction. So it could have a weight of like negative 100. It actually doesn't matter as yeah. long as it's negative, right? So this is going to be AND, and which is only going to light up when both inputs are 1. And when this lights up, it's going to inhibit the OR value. It's going to squash it back down. Make sense? That's the general strategy. So the hidden neurons. Again, in any neural network, we're computing subfunctions. And if we then have hidden neurons that are feeding into an output neuron, we're combining those subfunctions into another function. Right? Again, there are lots of ways to do this. Here's my OR function over here, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. I have a low threshold, because this should light up as 1 most of the time. Over here, again, I have 0.5 and 0.5. I set my threshold just above. 0.5 to create the AND function. I let the OR result flow down to the output neuron. Nothing flows down from AND in the first three cases, because the first three cases of AND is 0. But when both uh, inputs are 1, this lights up as 1. 1 times, uh, one times minus 1 is minus 1. If there's a 1 sitting in here, there's a 1 sitting in here, 1 minus 1 is 0, and the output is 0. The XOR is a nonlinear function, and we had to introduce this hidden layer to get our neural network to compute a nonlinear function. Why does that matter in a robotics class? Let's assume that we have a robot, and inside it has a neural network, and it's sensing its environment. It's taking that sensory information in, transforming that sensory data in some way, and then acting on that sensor data. It's transforming sensation into action. If we build a neural network like this, there are only certain things that the robot can do. We can change the synaptic weights 
which is going to change the output and change the behavior of the robot, but it's limited in, what, in the ways in which it can respond to what it senses. If we rip the, that neural network out and put this one in the robot instead, that robot is now smarter than the first one in the very nuts and bolts sense of it has a wider range of thing, ways in which it can react to what it's sensing. So far, so good? OK, so clearly, from a robotics point of view, you can start to imagine there are going to be situations where it's useful to have a hidden layer. There's one other component of intelligence that we've already talked about that's missing even from this, uh, this neural network here. What is it? A Turing machine can sense what's on the tape erase it, replace it with something else. What else can a Turing machine do that this neural network cannot yet do? Change state. There's no state in this neural network. We supply values at the input layer, and suddenly the output layer lights up. We remove the input, the output goes away. If we supply the exact same sensory input again, we get exactly the same output. There's no internal state yet. So we'll add some in a moment, but before we do, uh, I just want to talk about how do we actually set these synaptic weights. Back in the 1980s, there was an algorithm proposed known as backpropagation. And again, this isn't a class in neural networks, so we're just going to very briefly describe the intuition behind backpropagation. Imagine now I have the truth table on the right two inputs, and now there are two outputs that I want to get under certain circumstances. It doesn't really matter what they are, but let's imagine that there's this one circumstance where when the input layer is 0 and 1, we want to get 1 and 0 at the output layer. Let's assume in this example here we have these four synaptic weights. I'm not showing the activation threshold here. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. And in this cartoon example here, we want to get 1, 0 at the output layer. Uh, and instead, our network gives us back 1, 1. So this output neuron is correct. It has an error of 0. This output neuron is incorrect and gives us an error, a non-zero error. So we got the answer. The answer is part right. How do we change the synaptic weights to fix this issue? Assign responsibility for the error to each of the synapses assign responsibility to each of the synapses. In this cartoon example, it's relatively easy for us to do so. We, can, we know exactly who the culprits are, which synaptic weights are causing the problem. The ones which are pointing to that one that gave the error? The ones that are pointing to the second output neuron. So in backpropagation, as the name implies, we start with output neurons where there's non-zero error, and we propagate backwards, or in our case, upwards, we follow the synaptic weights backward, upstream, and as we go, we alter them. So I've changed them from 1, 1 to 0, 0. I'm not going to get into details of how you change these numbers, but if you change them, you can reduce the error at the erroneous output neuron. So I've altered these weights, and I've fixed the neural network. At least for this example, our neural network is now doing what we want it to do. OK, there's lots more to the backpropagation algorithm we're not going to talk about in this class. What I want you to take away from this is there's localized change. We didn't change all four synapses. We only changed two out of the four. Something we're going to see throughout this course is that if we're able to make localized change, we often are more likely to make an improvement to our system. You can think about backpropagation as applying tweezers to a neural network. It's only making changes where we need to make changes. Imagine that your uh, laptop breaks and you take it into the IT desk and they get out a mallet and start hitting it at random. They start trying to change all parts of your computer at the same time. How likely are they to fix the problem? Not very likely. Imagine instead they open up the chassis, and again, assuming they know what they're doing, they go in and make very small changes to just that part of your computer where there are problems, more likely to make an improvement. Right? Seems kind of obvious, but this will come up over and over again in this course. Okay. 
There's a problem with neural networks, which again, we will see in this course. This is known as overfitting. Again, here's just a cartoon to give you the intuition for this. Now our uh, data set on the right is a little more complex. We again have a bunch of things that we want our neural network to do. So every row here corresponds to one situation. In this cartoon example here, we're assuming this is in the health domain. Every row corresponds to a patient. And the first K columns represent whether or not that patient is exhibiting that particular symptom. It turns out that there tends to be some pattern between the symptoms that the patients are exhibiting and a disease that they're suffering from. But that relationship is not that clear. It's not if you have symptom K, you have the disease, and if you do not have symptom K, you do not have the disease. There seems to be some relationship between these symptoms. For uh, the clinician that's working on this problem, they look at the data set and they can't figure out what that relationship is. Let's try and create a neural network that will do it for us using, for example, the back propagation approach. In this cartoon example here, we have our input layer, output layer, and we have a large number of hidden neurons. Let's assume for our purposes, we're going to have n hidden neurons, which is actually equal to the number of patients. One of the tricky things about neural networks is actually knowing how many hidden neurons you need. In this case, our practitioners have chosen incorrectly, and here's why. We have n uh, hidden neurons, and we use the back propagation algorithm. It sets all the synaptic weights, which are not shown in this cartoon. It doesn't mat matter for our purposes. But unbeknownst to us, those weights are set in a certain way that whenever we supply the set of symptoms exhibited by patient 1 at the input layer, which we see here, the only the only hidden neuron that lights up is the first one. In essence, what's happening here is instead of this hidden neuron learning the OR function, it's learned the recognize the symptoms of patient one pattern. This neuron here only lights up when patient two is supplied at the input layer. The third hidden neuron only lights up when we supply the third patient and so on. So it's actually memorized all of the case histories of all of these N patients. And it ends up actually getting all the predictions exactly right. What would these synaptic weights be? If the hidden neurons have memorized and they only light up when they recognize their patient, what should be the outgoing synaptic weights from those hidden neurons? They should all be one? If it's overfitting, the yeah. output would just be uh, like positive if any of the cases are true. If any of the cases are true. So imagine, just for the sake of argument, imagine all these synaptic weights are 1. That means this value is always going to be 1, because it's always this neural network is always going to recognize one of the patients, assuming we're just supplying data from these n patients. So that doesn't help us, because our output neuron is always lighting up one or yes, and it's saying all the patients suffer from the disease. Yes, 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 yes. That's not what we want. We want the output neuron to give us back whether or not that patient is actually suffering from the disease. Remember that we know that information. It's over there in the data set. Patient one has the disease, patient two does not. What should we set these synaptic weights at the output layer to be? Whatever that column was for each patient. Whatever the column was for that patient. So if this patient, uh, if this patient one lights up, this patient does have the disease. So we should set the synaptic weight to be plus one. One times one is one. Great. Right? Patient two, assuming that this neuron lights up and all the other ones are silent, patient two does not have the disease. So we should set this synaptic weight to minus one. One times minus <laughs> one is zero or no. Right. Uh, I tell you the day before that we're going to have a surprise final exam in this, uh, in this class. You haven't studied or kept up with the reading. You find people that have taken this class in previous years. You get final exams from them, and you memorize all the questions from previous exams, walk into the current exam, and hope that I reuse questions from the past, right? Assuming that I do, you're golden, right? Like 
our cheating neural network here. You memorize answers from the past. If we present this neural network with data from any of these n patients, it also gets things correct. What happens if patient n plus 1 walks into the emergency room, and that patient n plus 1 is exhibiting a unique pattern of symptoms that doesn't exist in all the other patients? I put a new question on the final exam that has never been on any of the previous exams. How is the neural network going to do in this case? How are you going to do with that question on the final exam? Not so good, right? Basically 50-50 in this case. This is a big problem in neural networks. There's lots of ways to fight against overfitting. None of those uh, solutions in my uh, in, my, in my opinion, are very satisfying. There's probably better ways out there. We will also see examples of robots that cheat in this way later. Okay, I promised you uh, internal state, so let's have a look at that. We're going to introduce the last building block of neural networks, at least for our purposes, which are recurrent connections. All of the arrows or the synapses that you've seen so far are flowing down or downstream, if you like, from input to output but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. You can also add synaptic connections that connect neurons at the same layer, or even reach backwards from output neurons towards input neurons. Let's have a look at this little simple cartoon here. Two sensors, two motors, and we have these two recurrent connections here. Let's assume we put our robot in our virtual environment and the robot senses no light on its left sensor and some light on its right sensor. And again, depending on the synaptic weights, we get these two values arriving at the motor layer, one, one, both the wheels spin forward at that point in time. At the next time step, the robot has moved, it's embodied, and it's situated, because it moved, it changed its relationship to the light source, and now there are different sensor values arriving at the input layer. Now, we have, these value, we have these values here left over from the previous time step. When we're computing the new value of motor one, we see now that there are three incoming synaptic connections. So the new value of motor one is a, is a function of current sensor value times this weight, plus this current sensor value times this synaptic weight, plus the value of the neuron at the previous time step times this synaptic weight. So we have a weighted sum with three terms in it in this case. The value one that is sitting in motor, uh, motor two, that is a remembrance of things past, right? That's what the wheel did at the previous time step as a function of what it sensed. So in essence, it's holding on to a little bit of memory or state. In this case, at the third time step, if the robot again experienced zero, one, what would we get at the output layer? Would we get one, one again? Not necessarily, right? We haven't, I haven't told you what the synaptic weights are, but again, with pen and paper, you can sit down and try and do this exercise by hand. And you'll notice that no matter what synaptic weights you choose, usually, if you present the same sensory information again, you'll get a different output. That is extremely important in robotics and in adaptive behavior uh, in general. If you're an organism or a machine and you're trapped to always do exactly the same thing when you're presented with the same stimulus, you're in trouble, right? I'm a young child, I see this red hot stove and I touch it. Hopefully the next time I see a red hot stove I will not touch it, right? Hopefully I will learn something and hold on to that internal state and do something different when I'm presented with that same dangerous stimuli. Very important for robotics. Okay. Okay, so we've added, uh, we've added memory to our neural network by adding these recurrent connections. Let's come back to our discussion about backpropagation for a moment. Again, in this case, we have our output layer here doing the right thing here, but the wrong thing here. Backpropagation tells us we have to follow all of the arrows going backwards out from the area where there's a problem which in this case is this one. So we follow this, uh, we follow, sorry, we follow this arrow back, this arrow back, and this arrow back. 
this arrow takes us here. We have to keep back propagating the error. So we follow this error back, arrow back, this arrow back, and this arrow back. We have now touched every single synapse and probably changed it. Here's the example of applying a sledgehammer to a system that's partly working. Not a very good uh, solution. Okay, I think we will leave things there for today. You have a quiz due tonight. You have assignment two due Monday night, and I will see you all uh, next Tuesday. Have a good day.